It's a Benjamin Ray here with Sustainability Live, and I am here with Jeffrey Hang. How are you doing today? Good, Ben. How are you doing? Excellent. Thanks. Good. So did you get some snow down in Morrison? Uh, a little bit, probably about a half inch, yeah. Cold snow. We though. got, we got, uh, so, so I'm, uh, I'm close to Jeffrey, about a half hour away drive. I'm more kind of uh, in a little bit east of Denver, and we got about four or five inches, so it must have just blown all over you there. Yeah, we're, we're kind of tucked up against the hill, so it kind of blows over us a little to the south usually. Well, it was, uh, it's, it's beautiful here, though. It's sunny today, so it should be yeah. a nice day. Well, Jeffrey, he's a, he's a technical sales uh, engineer with uh, Seven Leaf Packaging and Delta Technologies, and uh, the, the two are kind of combined. But, I'll, Jeffrey, I'll let you talk kind of about those the companies and how they work together, a little bit about your background before we jump into some questions. And and kind of how you got to where you are today. Okay, sure. Yeah, so uh, I've got a client right now, uh, Delta Technologies and Seven Leaf Packaging. Uh, Delta Technologies is a 20 plus year old company uh, based out of Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, about a year and a half ago, they hatched an idea to launch a new company called Seven Leaf Packaging, specifically starting in Colorado, which is why they brought me on board. Um, company historically was about a two and a half to $3 million company was acquired by a gentleman named Lyle Rusinowski about seven years ago. And we're about a nine, $10 million company as of this year. And we're carrying about 13 million in quotes into the fall into 2021. So um, really good growth, uh, great company to work for, really cool people, a deep bench of engineers. We've got 20 engineers spanning different disciplines from mechanical engineering, uh, electrical, PLC, robotics, vision systems, um, uh, transport, material handling, and then program management as well. So a really deep bench and a lot of experience. Uh, my background is heavy in um, manufacturing and operations. Uh, I've worked with various industries ranging from designing vacuum chambers thin film for, for thin film transistors. Uh, I did some work in some food and uh, cleanliness processing equipment, uh, IT, telecom. Uh, for a little stint there, I did some... Um, water park structure design hmm. uh, and, and design here in Colorado. And then also at one point launched my own fly fishing guide service. So kind of a mixed bag uh, from my background. Well, you know, in Colorado, we all end up doing a lot here. There's a lot of opportunity and a lot of fun things to do. And, yeah. and what I wanted to talk to you today about was sustainability and scaling kind of packaging automation. And I know you're, you know, you're really focused on that. And really, you know, especially within the cannabis industry, uh, and other industries where you're doing packaging automation, there's heavy turnover. And I wanted to ask you, how do you how do you eliminate that? And what can you work on that would change the high turnover within the industry? Sure, sure. Um, I, I, I know there's a lot of reasons for the heavy turnover. Um, I've seen product lines and SKUs come into production facilities. And then when sales don't can't support the, the, the production, the brand goes away. And then that creates the turnover and churn for products um, coming through a production facility. Uh, typically we work in a MIP, which is the uh, marijuana infused locations. And then, um, you know, there's also people being cherry picked in the industry. You know, the bud tenders I know kind of float from uh, location to location, but when, when it comes to scaling and, and um, retaining workforce, when people start talking automation, the knee jerk reaction is kind of, well, you just want to replace employees. And mm. most times that's not the case because we need somebody to run the machine. Mm. So what in reality ends up happening is you identify that key employee that's going to run this particular machine. It might be a labeler. It might be a filling machine, like a tincture filler. It might be a, um, a flow wrapper, which does the, the, inline uh, continuous flow, uh, foil sealing. And so you're gonna train that specific employee how to run and troubleshoot and program the machine because there all, are always new SKUs coming through. So somebody that has that knowledge is going to become more valuable for your organization. Um, if you do have heavy labor content, you can reallocate those resources to other bottlenecks. And, and um, we have a lot of tools to help identify those bottlenecks even before we start talking automation. Um, one of the exciting things we have going on is uh, what's called our uh, road mapping program. And 
if you hire us as a consultant, the upfront costs of the consulting fees can be applied 100% directly to the purchase of any piece of equipment. So the, the, the money spent up front for the knowledge base and, and um, some of those tools that we can implement ahead of time uh, before automation comes into your facility is applied right to the equipment. So you don't lose that money. Um, mm. We know it's, it's cash can be tight in some of these industries and capital expenses are challenging to get through this industry. Um, now, when, when we had, I had a MIP in Commerce City that we had a waters machine. So we, you know, it was CO2 extraction. So we had to train people specifically for that. And so it, it seems like what you're saying too, is that the, the, the more specialized the equipment or the operation, the more specialized the people have to be and the more kind of valuable that those people will be. Yeah. And what we did to, to go through the, the different variances in terms of demand is we would train people to do a few different things. Mm -hmm. So we would hire people for, you know, their, you know, not necessarily their technical skill, but just, you know, they were good employees and then train them in different areas so that we could keep them, you know, yeah. doing things. There's a, there's a question here from Nisha. Employees are not always treated or paid well for the amount of work they do. You know, and, and uh, I think that in the, in the cannabis industry specifically, a lot of people want to get into the industry and, and it is a lower paying, you know, hourly job, but a lot of people want to be in the industry to get that experience. And it, it is a challenge. And I think that that's something that the cannabis industry as a whole needs to do is to really step up in, in the business aspect to be on par with, with payment for uh, appropriate amount of labor. At least that's what I've seen over the years. Even though it's a young industry, I think that's an area where we can grow. What's your experience with that? So you touched on a little bit, you know, the, the cross training and the redundancy that just makes more of those employees valuable. Um, and you're right. The pay is generally lower because there is such a demand. People for many years have been moving to Colorado specifically to get into the cannabis industry. And, you know, they may not have farming experience, but they want to work in a cultivation. So they're going to get the on the job training and the pay is likely to reflect that where if you were to bring, you know, a, an ag degree from, you know, one of the local universities to help with genetics, let's say, or something like that, um, you know, creating new strains, uh, it, it's probably going to demand a little higher price uh, for that individual. So um, it, it's kind of an influx of people, I think, is the main factor. Uh, on why the jobs are, are lower paid because there are so many people that are interested in getting in the industry. And it's kind of tough to crack into because you have to have your key badge or your support badge, uh, pass your background check, you know. Um, but once you're in, you know, everyone seems to enjoy the work. Um, as from an automation guy standpoint, I, I see the labor content that's involved in some of these things. So it does take a lot of people. Uh, and for the most part, people are working just one shift. You might have a second shift skeleton crew. Uh, so there's opportunities there as well. And, and for more pay to work an off shift schedule in some cases. You know, and you know, when my, my question was how to eliminate turnover and, you know, there is, there is a thought that if you do get experience in a lot of different places, you're going to be more well-rounded. And then you do have that experience when you're going into a place where you can specialize. So in some ways, if a company can, you know, speaking from a company perspective, if you can manage that turnover mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, treating the employees properly and, you know, helping them actually mentoring them to learn those new skills when they, when they leave to another place, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. If you know, your SOPs are still standard and you don't, don't have to retrain and spend money to do that. If your program's are, are anticipating that people will come and go. It's a way to manage the turnover, uh, not necessarily just, you know, eliminate the turnover. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's all management and it's going to be tough to eliminate turnover in any industry. Uh, in my own experience coming from manufacturing, product life cycles are just too short. You know, you might get a year and a half anymore out of any one product, three mm -hmm. if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned uh, standardization, which is also another trick because state by state, we all know that the regulatory varies. So for a multi-state operator, standardization is really tough. Mm -hmm. But if employees can come to the table and say, look, I 
I took my uh, training from this lean system, this uh, lean manufacturing, or I did a visual um, workplace training online. Um, all those things add to efficiencies in the production facility and can be very valuable for the employees, you know, potentially saving thousands and thousands of dollars on an annual basis just by making, you know, simple common sense changes, which are sort of best practices established by the automotive industries back in the early 80s. So, so it's uh, not necessarily just the company's responsibility, but if an employee takes it on themselves to do training and learn different parts, they'll be more valuable, like yeah. I suppose any business, and you can, uh, you know, I guess, command a higher, you know, price. Yeah, so one simple example is um, 5S training. And basically it's um, sort, shine, standardize, sustain, and there's no, the fifth S I don't remember, but it's basically keep your workplace in order so you're not chasing around tools all day. Hmm. I know mm -hmm. I did that in my garage all the time. And so I finally put a pegboard on every wall on the inside of my garage and everything has a place and there's a place for everything. Uh, and that's kind of the mentality of it. So if you're looking for a crescent wrench for 15 minutes, because there's only one crescent wrench for an entire you know, station or production floor. Well, now you've got to disrupt other people to say, hey, where'd my crescent wrench go? Mm. Where if it was on a shadow board or if it was on a pegboard where you can visually see if something's missing right away, you can go searching for that crescent wrench right away. So when you don't, when you need it, you can find it easily. So a lot of it's common sense. Um, but if you go through the training and the discipline to actually take time away from production to work on the business instead of working in the business, it can pay dividends really quickly. I think after this call, I'm going to get some pegboard for this pen and put it right up. Here. <laughs> exactly. Now, so we've got a, a comment here. Uh, this, this is from Ramiro uh, based on what you were saying before. Most cannabis breeders with the top cannabis genetics, hands on knowledge usually do not hold a degree, a degree. And I'm wondering in your experience, you know, how many people do come into this industry with a degree and how many do not? Ooh, it'd, be put, it'd be tough to put a number on it. I would say a majority that started when, it's, when it became legal did not, but they had the experience from years and years and years of growing, extracting, uh, you know, home tinkering, maybe a small uh, operation, maybe a big operation, you know, tucked away in the hills somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm seeing and what was my case is that some of the larger operators are starting to pick from manufacturing disciplines, uh, from operations disciplines, uh, a lot more ERP systems that you see uh, other than metric, um, but they've got APIs that work within metric, but are much more intuitive. So you're seeing some of those folks come into the industry um, to a either help set up the discipline for a group that may not may not have the formal education, or um, they may have gotten into a regulatory challenge that they need to fix and need some real regulatory pros. Uh, so it's the industries are starting to merge. And so it's pretty exciting from an equipment standpoint, because as the players get bigger and the production needs grow and, you know, ideally when it does go legal nationwide, we can then ship over state lines, then the, everything is going to become more centralized and much more uh, focused efforts on large volume production. Yeah, right now it's so decentralized, you know, with all the different, you know, regulations for, for not only states, but in counties, municipalities. It's uh, that's that's uh, that's a challenge, but I think it's going to start, you know, with packs of states and then, you know, working together as we're starting to see kind of in the northeast a little bit. Uh, yeah. Governors kind of working together. So, um, well, I wanted to you touched on something a second ago, which was kind of the the uh, labor intensive aspects of kind of production lines. And, you know, can you explain how to kind of work with that? Because it is again and again and again, all day long. And, you know, that may contribute to some of the, you know, turnover, but in general, can you talk about that labor intensive aspect of, of scalability within sure. packaging automation? Yeah, so in my experience, what I've seen is 
every production facility is rushing to make that Friday's deliveries or that month end delivery. Um, and then they've got the cash flow side of it, which is its own challenge. But um, some of the standard practices, like I mentioned before, the lean manufacturing, like single piece continual flow, a lot of that's not happening yet. Um, hmm. You see a lot of batch processes. So let's say you've got a future Ola knockbox, uh, not to name drop, but you know you have to load all those cones into that box and that becomes a batch where the time spent loading those cones, you could be filling those cones and handing off to the next station without any automation necessary. Hmm. Um, there's the aspect of the repetitive motion. Uh, so twisting a, a pre-roll all day long for weeks and weeks and months and months on end, I know I couldn't do it. Um, that that's just too much for my wrist to handle and you know my hands to handle. Uh, so some of the tools that are available out there to do these tasks exist, uh, but like I say, it's a big capital expense to take some of this equipment on. It's easier to throw labor at it, and that seems to be the the natural reaction at this point of the industry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're going to start to see some robotics come into it, but it's going to be a while. And I know now because there's a demand and because a lot of people want to get their foot in the door, you know, and I've heard this from many kind of owner operators is that we can find we can find 10 people that will do this job for low pay, which is not good. You know, that's not right. a good way to to think or act or actually run your company. But that is the fact right now. So, um you know, it's it's interesting really to see how robotics may come into it, but it's going to be a while, I think, before that happens, you know. Yeah, so we've got a couple systems coming online here uh, first quarter next year. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. We've got a pretty slick gummy and chocolate depositor, uh, which we call Feature Rich at a low price point. Um, we also have a, a cone rolling system that we're offering on-demand cone rolling services. So we come to your MIP and uh, stand up the equipment, we train you on it, mm. and then you don't have to purchase the equipment, but it's a per unit cost. Mm. So if it's end of harvest and you want us to come in for two weeks, we'll come in for two weeks. If it's the, you know, a three month production that you have, we'll come in for the three months. And, and then we take on the maintenance, the cleaning, and all the spares and consumable parts on the machine. So there's no uh, in-house headache from your folks and, and no capital outlay. So we've got some exciting stuff coming. So I think robotics is a little closer, but that's, I think we're pushing, pushing kind of hard right now. The, uh, here's a, here's a question here from Chris, if you could address this automation generally equals batching a uh, big waste. What do you, what do you think about that? So Chris, I agree. Batching is bad. Um, automation and continuous piece flow as long as you know where your waste is being generated, usually you can design it around it or um, recapture it. Uh, in the case of our new gummy depositor, uh, we saw an existing system that had the uh, pectin and, and glycerin gummies drooling after the full shot of, let's say, a three gram gummy. Um, so, you know, there was an operator cleaning all that up and that's what they said their biggest headache was is is the, all the cleanup and it's sticky and you know you got to change the gloves all the time and then it's the waste so she was standing there with with a ball of gummy roughly the size of a golf ball and i said what's stopping you from just taking a big old bite out of that goo ball <laughs> and she looked at me and said nothing <laughs> so you've got you know the loss from your waste so what we've done to combat that um is a, a check valve on the dispense unit that has a drawback feature which eliminates any drooling so you get your gummy in your little mold and that's it you don't get any strings you get no drool from mm -hmm. one row to the next or, or one um, mat to the next so there's design parameters you can take care of um, there's best practices whether it's reclaiming the material and not having to claim it as scrap and metric um, but then it might be just a different type of hand tool that might make it easier for the operator. There's there's a lot of different levels of how you can make things better and eliminate the batching and eliminate the scrap. So when you have when in your SOPs, you can say, you know, we're we're planning for this so that we don't have waste. So the more that you plan, the more that it's documented, then you know, employees can reach up on a binder, pull it out, they can see what they need to do and they don't have to make it up. And just yep. that time from knowing where things are 
from your comment about the pegboard and just having those documented are really going to yeah. help eliminate labor costs and just waste. Yeah. One thing um, I saw in a uh, vape company I was working with, um, at one point, the cartridges all needed to sit under under camera quarantine for 24 hours, which automatically increased our lead time by a full day. Hmm. Uh, the, the flip side to that is it took the cotton pad inside the vape uh, quite a bit of time at room temperature to absorb the oil. So when the consumer got it, it wouldn't result in a dry hit the first time on that cartridge. Um, once the um, batching of the quarantine process was eliminated. Uh, then we went to roughly a 20 minute under a heat lamp to saturate that um, uh, cotton pad. And, you know, okay, 20 minutes versus 24 hours, that's pretty good improvement without making a whole lot of shift in, in production. You know, you buy a $9 heat lamp and you're off and running. Um, but then summer came around and, you know, the cotton would, would saturate within five or 10 minutes anyway. So, uh, there's a lot of different variables that can impact production rates. Um, and you sometimes don't know them until you experience them. So well, I would say that's, that's a big point is that, that you can't just grab SOP from a previous company. Let's say it was in a different type of manufacturing and apply it, especially to cannabis, especially if you're working with, you know, vape viscosity, you mm -hmm. know, strains, whatever that is, it's completely different for everyone. So it does take that experience yep. to really go through some, um, and you may have to fail quite a bit to understand what's going to work if, yeah. it's, you know, new hardware and, you know, your products going in and different, you know, as we're, we found elevations, you know, here in Colorado, people would take their, their vapes up skiing or they would go hiking in the summer. You really have to account for that. You have to account for the, yeah. the leak, the heat, all that. And because what you don't want is your, you know, the end user to just say, oh, this sucks, you know, whatever it is, yeah. Yeah. whatever that is. Um, you know, and it could be it could be a hundred things that go wrong. So yeah. let's take that that uh, that experience kind of you know to another yeah. level, and you can take care of it in the in the in the operations for sure. So. Yeah, things like a cartridge sitting on a dashboard versus sitting in an outside pocket of a ski jacket, they behave completely differently. So That's right. yeah, That's right, yeah, and and there's even what it's it's the the holes with inside the hardware are different depending on the viscosity and the altitude. So there's a lot that you have to think about in there, especially if you're going to be a multi-state operator, as you said, and ship out to different states, that's going to be a big challenge, you know, for for a lot of companies to work with. So yeah, well, I want to get into this, this question here about optimizing the space. So using optimization to utilize the space that you have to work with. And you touched on that a little bit, that you could bring equipment into a MIP. But what are your thoughts on that about space and scaling and optimization? So there's a lot of tools to use um, for space management. One that I like to use is called a work breakdown study. And basically you break it down if the operator needs to pick up a wrench. Um, let's, well, let's use a better example, a, uh, a cake pipette gun to fill a gummy mold. Uh, they've got to pick it up squeeze it, weigh the, the gummy operation, um, you know, the, the gummies going through the operation. And then they have to drop those gummies into a uh, cooling rack and probably some sort of refrigerator. So you have to travel X distance um, as part of the value stream of that process as it is today. And that's where that work breakdown study is a really good um, detailed list of all the steps that go into production. Uh, there's another tool called a spaghetti diagram where you take a floor plan of your site. You've got your tables laid out. You've got your number of operators. You've got your production steps. And then you just draw lines of where you're traveling within your uh, facility and how many handoff points there are and how many touch points. From there, you do your as is, and then you look forward to where you want to be. So let's say your production takes roughly start to finish, let's say half a day but you've only got three or four touch points that should maybe only happen in an hour and a half. I mean, mm. it's possible when it comes to, you know, say cone rolling. Um, that spaghetti diagram gives a really good visual because the more chaotic that diagram comes out, you have crossing paths of employees. 
you've got work that might be coming back upstream in your production, which then has to get back downstream closer to shipping. So, you know, you've got orders coming in one end of the building and orders and shipments going out the other end. That's an ideal situation, but we all know the footprint of a facility may not support that. So you want to minimize those crossing paths, um, work being sent back upstream, uh, things of that nature. It's, it's the tools are readily available, uh, but it takes, like I say, it, it takes cons focused effort to spend the time and do the diligence to see where you're at and where you want to go and how you can get there. So how has, has COVID and distancing changed things within side of these operations, um, you know, that you've seen? Um, day to day, not a whole lot. A lot of folks were already wearing gloves, already wearing hair nets, already wearing face covers. Um, there were already some discussions of HACCP plans, which are the hazardous control uh, points. Mm -hmm. So maybe people had to spray their boots off before walking into the grow room to bring, to, to eliminate any pesticides coming in or anything salts from the, from the driveway outside. Um, I've seen, I've, I've heard stories of folks where an entire shift early on would call in sick or no, sorry, call in scared. Call in not scared. Sick, an entire shift of 11 people in golden Colorado called in scared. And so that shut down their production for the entire day. Wow. Um, that was an early reaction, but I think things have kind of settled back down because the cannabis industry was already starting to operate with GMP, you know, good manufacturing practices. So yeah, uh, Jeff, uh, I think I lost you here for a okay. moment. Here we go there. Oh, we lost you there for a second. So you're talking okay. about the EMP that the industry was starting yeah. to move in the direction. So already starting to evolve into good manufacturing practices, whether they're driven from the pharmaceutical side of the world or the food processing uh, side of the world, the materials chosen. So the cleanliness within cannabis was is, is already getting set up. The regulatory side has not really started being enforced very heavily yet, but it's coming. Um but, but I think the cannabis industry was at least setting up relatively well for general cleanliness and best practices when it comes to handling products that are going to be inserted into people's mouths and, you know, ingested, used as creams, things like that. So um, it's at least people have become mindful of it a little more, uh, but I don't think a whole lot has changed. Probably some of those floor plans and, and work steps have spaced out a little bit more. So it's not as optimized, but uh, hopefully that, you know, changes here in the next few months where production can be optimized more and more within the facilities. Yeah, I, I hope so. Yeah. The main takeaways are, are more organization is better, more kind of discipline and in, in understanding your planning is better, more regulation is better, more education, um, you know, all the stuff that normal, well, other businesses have, are coming to the cannabis industry. And the sooner that we can get those here in this industry, the better it's going to be for everyone involved. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, the, the excitement that people bring to this industry, once they see some of these tools, uh, and then it relies heavily on the production folks to identify some of these opportunities to say, hey, these gloves don't fit. I've, I've got these tiny little hands and these big gloves and I need to reach into this oven. You know, this would be an improvement and mm -hmm. it, little things like that, that incrementally add up and can make a big difference in the long run. And unless you're like right there on the front lines, experiencing it, experiencing it day to day, it's not something you can kind of pick out standing back until you actually get your hands on the work. So that's where the excitement comes is when the workforce and the operator starts saying, hey, I got this cool idea for a, a fixture that if it could just do this, it would save, you know, five steps or something like that. And that's mm -hmm. when the fun starts, because now you get these feedback loops that just start to spiral and, and it gets this head of uh, steam and this momentum. And it's pretty exciting stuff. So more, get more collaboration, more cooperation, more communication. All will be good. Exactly. We'll yep, be exactly. Exactly. Well, that's uh, great. I, I appreciate you coming on this show. How can people get a hold of you um, the best way? Uh, best way would be right here with the, uh, the email, Jeff at Seven Leaf Packaging, number seven, uh, or just hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active there. 
um, happy to uh, network and help folks out where I can. Well, uh, it's, uh, you've, you've got tons of information and that was really informative. I, I want to thank you for that, that kind of in-depth, in-depth view of, uh, of operations and scaling. Where, where are you going to be in a year or where will the industry be and what has changed? What will have changed in your opinion, if you were to predict in the next year? Uh, there'll be a lot more states involved. So there's going to be the continuous learning curve, which is exciting. Uh, the people that have already been up the learning curve may be able to take advantage by relocating to other states and starting their own uh, production. Um, my guess that the industry will continue to see the larger acquisitions and centralization of at least the administrative part of things. Um, and hopefully the states can come together to help drive what the feds will eventually accept as those good manufacturing practices and standards for the industry. Uh, we're seeing some of it with heavy metals testing, mm -hmm. uh, mold, pesticides, um, but even those are spotty uh, across state lines. So I think the standardization, the centralization, and the opportunities for new states, I think, are the big areas that will happen. Great. Excellent. Well, thanks. And uh, stay warm down there. And right. we'll uh, talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. All right. Take care.